Welcome everyone to this taster lecture. Um, let me first make sure you're all okay. Um, please shout at me if, if there's a problem you can't hear me or there's a problem with my mic. Um, are you all okay? Please, please uh, someone tell me whether you can hear me um, because obviously I don't know whether you can hear me. Um, basically, um, I will first introduce myself and then um, say a little bit about the uh, presentation and do the presentation. But I do hope we have some time towards the end uh, for some questions or discussion. Brilliant. Okay, great. Thanks for letting me know that you can hear me. Um, I will obviously keep half an eye on the chat. Uh, so if there are any problems, so you want me to go slower or faster, uh, please do let me know. Okay, so my name is Julia Hordler. I've been at CCLI since 2000. Um, I've been a professor there since 2013. And um, I've been teaching basically all areas of cyber law, internet law, internet regulation. I've always been interested particularly in this problem of jurisdiction and the internet, because it seems to me that this is one of the fundamental crunch points in a way of cyberspace law. The fact that most laws are still made on a national basis, but of course the internet by its way nature, by its way technology transcends borders. So the question arises, which law applies and uh, which courts have jurisdiction? Um, I've just published Oh, I will, I've just submitted, I should say, I will publish a book on this area, um, which is this one. Uh, so sharing my screen. Um, it's Oxford University Press. It'll come out hopefully in October, although I'm already a bit late with the proofs. Um, and there's also a chapter on there on specifically on defamation and personality disputes. Um, which, which you might be interested in. Um, okay, now there's only 13 of us. So we could try if you want to all, to all put on the video so we can actually see each other, which might be nicer for you. I, I don't mind if you, if you don't want to share a video, if you're somewhere where you don't want to be seen. As you can see, I'm sitting in a kitchen, so it just seems to be the nature of, um, you know, the, the new post-COVID uh, state of affairs that we're all working from home and in a way um, broadcast that. Um, so, so you're welcome to share your video. Um, we can always see how we're going with, with the uh, broadband. Okay, so I'll start the lecture and say a little bit about the topic. So um, I'm focusing today specifically on online defamation and jurisdiction. Now, the interesting thing about online defamation, I think, is that the law varies enormously from country to country. Um, in the UK, specifically, or maybe I should say England and Wales, um, online defamation has been characterized by civil action. So there's hardly any uh, criminal law relating to online defamation. So online defamation is mainly a civil law matter. So you basically have the uh, claimant suing uh, a publisher for damages for a false statement. So what is defamation to start off with? You probably know, but just briefly, defamation is basically a false statement which injures the reputation of the claimant in such a way that they suffer harm, which is then to be compensated by damages or, of course, uh, the other uh, remedy is an injunction to prevent publication. Um, I think culturally in England, um, defamation has been characterized by very high damage awards. So you have a very aggressive press, I guess, compared to, to other jurisdictions. And in a way, high stakes in the sense that if they publish a lie about someone, they're potentially liable 
for very high um, damages. And it's for that reason, I guess, that, the, that England has been a very attractive location to sue for defamation because the claimant potentially can achieve very high damage awards. So that's just uh, really by way of, of, of background. So um, just to give you a couple of examples. So say in, in, in one case, uh, someone claims on social media that the claimant is a pedophile and has been abusing children. And basically this social media post is shared and reposted all across the world. So the defendant then obviously wants to know where can they sue. Um, all sorts of obviously defamatory claims. There are many claims, uh, obviously someone alleging that someone is a fraudster or someone has connections to the mafia or, you know, basically the possibility for defamation are endless. And I guess in recent years, the social media have enabled everyone uh, to become a publisher. I guess that's the fundamental structural change we've seen in recent years. If you think of the free online world, you know, to publish something in a newspaper, you had to get past an editor of that newspaper who obviously has some control over the content. By contrast, on social media and the interactive web, bloggers, etc., everyone can publish and with immediate worldwide publication effect. Now, of course, that is great if you think about freedom of expression, but it's also very dangerous in terms of online defamation. So, this jurisdictional conflict is not just about the technical rules of private international law and, and, and the practical question of where you can sue. It is actually intimately linked with the question of access to redress by someone who's been defamed, but also freedom of expression in online communications, because arguably a defamation suit can of course be used to suppress legitimate criticism or true statements and therefore affects freedom of, of expression. And therefore it's intimately connected really to cultural and political notions of the limits of privacy and reputation protection. And those limits differ enormously from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And the choice of one party's local court as the competent court and one party's domestic law as the applicable law may actually favor one party's case over that of the other. So the decision as to where you can sue and which law applies might have an enormous outcome on the case. Now, in, in this lecture, obviously, uh, I focus on two sets of law. So first of all, you might ask yourself, well, how do we determine which court is actually the competent court? And here, it is important to remember that the rules of jurisdiction are actually national rules. So there's not like an international convention or anything which determines conclusively um, which court has jurisdiction. So essentially, the claimant and there's the defendant, they have to decide which courts they're going to approach and where do they file an action in, and then you apply the national rules of that particular court, the civil procedure rules, to determine whether that court can hear that case. So jurisdictional rules are essentially national rules. Now, of course, if these rules could be harmonized on an international basis, then that would be a good thing, because then it makes it clearer we have only one set of rules uh, on jurisdiction. And that's exactly what has happened within the European Union. So already in 1968, so a long time ago, long before the internet, the European communities decided that they want to harmonize as far as possible the rules on jurisdiction. Now that this has gone through various transformation over the years, but the current legal instrument is the so-called Brussels regulation, EU 1215, 2012, so it's from 2011, came into force in 2012. Um, but the rules haven't significantly changed, I'm generalizing, of course, since 1968. So this particular European piece of legislation still applies to the UK, but, and I guess it will continue to apply to England 
until the law is changed, which could happen obviously next year, because as no doubt you're all aware of Brexit and that the UK is uh, leaving the EU by the end of this year. But at the moment, no change. So the European rules, basically they apply if one of the defendants is domiciled within the EU. Otherwise, whatever courts uh, rules apply, basically the national rules apply. So it's only a partial harmonization, which only applies if the defendant is actually domiciled within the EU. Now, under most systems of court jurisdiction rules, the claimant can sue in the defendant's court. So the victim of our defamation, um, this person who's been falsely been called a pedophile, can of course go to the courts of the person who's, who's, who's liable and sue in the defendant's court. But normally that's not very favorable for the, for the claimant because A, the claimant may have no access to the defendant's court or the law might be really unfavorable in the defendant's court. Um, so usually the claimant either wishes to strategically sue in the jurisdiction in the country they want to sue in or in their own local jurisdiction. So most systems of jurisdiction have additional rules as to determine the competent court. And in Europe, that's Article 7.2. Article 7.2 applies to torts and other wrongful acts. And it basically states that the claimant can sue in the place or in the places where the harmful event occurred. So it's the place where the harmful event occurred. So what does that mean in relation to defamation? Well, first of all, we have to take into account an old case from 1976. This is a case which has absolutely nothing to do with defamation. Uh, in fact, it's an environmental law case. But I guess what is similar to, uh, in terms of jurisdiction online and en environmental law is that often a tort is spread over several countries, which then raises the question, well, which country can you sue in? So in the beer case, um, basically this has nothing to do with beer. <laughs> in this case, we have a, a Dutch gardening business um, and their plants were damaged and their crop was damaged by apparently a French company polluting the River Rhine. And then obviously they were, um, they were using the waters from the River Rhine and that kind of destroyed their crop. So we have a Dutch company as the claimant pitched against a French company who allegedly has polluted the waters of the River Rhine. So the question was, can this Dutch company sue in the Netherlands and doesn't have to go all the way to France to sue this uh, mining company there? And here the court in interestingly said, well, actually this claimant can choose where to sue. They can either sue in the place where the event giving rise to the damage occurred or the place where the direct damage occurred. So in other words, they can sue where the tort was committed, which would have been obviously in France, where the uh, pollutants were ejected into the River Rhine, or they could sue where the direct damage occurred, which obviously was in the Netherlands when those crops were destroyed. Um, so often under this rule in Article 7.2 and its interpretation in beer, this means that a claimant can sue in their own domicile if the damage fell in, in, in that country. So what does that now mean for uh, defamation? Um, so the place where the damage occurs in a defamation, what does that mean? Well, that means of course, well, what's the damage for defamation? It's damage to reputation. So basically, if the claimant can show that their reputation was damaged in a particular country within the EU under the European rules, then they can sue there. So this can be the claimant's domicile or any place where the claimant has substantial family or business connections. 
So going back to our example of someone calling a person a pedophile, and this is a defamation on on a social media site, you know, whether you know whatever social media site you want to choose, whether that's you know Twitter or Instagram or whatever, and say our victim of this particular false claim is a, for argument's sake, Italian business person um, who has a reputation all over the European Union, is domiciled in Italy, and there's a lot of business in London. So that's the victim, that's the potential claimant. Our defendant is a disgruntled um, competitor who's based in France. So the place where the damage occurs, where the reputation is damaged, well, is probably in Italy, where, where this businessman lives, but it, he could also sue in any of the other European countries where they have a reputation because they're doing business there or because of family and other business connections, say, in, in England. So potentially it gives the claimant a choice between different uh, jurisdictions. Now you could say, well, this is really unfair because the defendant, in this case, the um, French person who said that this person is a, is, a, is a pedophile, well, they can't really control where their communication reaches on social media. Do you see the difference from, you know, think of the good old days where you had a newspaper. Well, the newspaper is controlled by an editor. So first of all, the editor will decide whether that should go in or whether it shouldn't go in. But secondly, a newspaper would normally be distributed in a controlled way, either only within a national border or if across several borders, then the newspaper can kind of know where, where this, uh, where this uh, publication is made. But of course, on social media, you can't because you just don't know where this online communication ends up. And the third problematic aspect of this is, of course, that uh, once a publication is widely sp spread across several states, this can lead to multiple possible venues. Um, so going back to beer, this is the starting point for the European courts, um, where basically they are competent if either the event giving rise to the damage occurred there, so where the, the, the tort was, was carried out, or the place where the harm fell. So what does this mean now in relation to the first uh, limb? So the place where the tort was committed. That's the first limb under beer. Now, even that is not clear, right, in relation to defamation. Where is the de defamation carried out? Where is it committed? This can be the place where the conduct took place. So it can be literally where the person sat when they were typing in this false statement. It could be where the publication occurred, which is often the case in defamation. The defamation is committed at the place where it is published. Well, what does publication mean actually on social media, right? You know, where is a, you know, something you post on Twitter, where is that actually uh, published? So this is also interesting. So under the common law, and the main case here is actually an Australian case called Goodnick, where the courts, the High Court of Australia in this case, said that the place where the statement is accessed or downloaded is the place of publication, and that's the place where the tort is committed. So let's pause here for a moment. The place where the statement is accessed is the place of publication, right? So everywhere and anywhere where this defamation is accessed can give rise to a potentially to a claim because this is the place where the tort was committed. So again, this makes it very likely that the tort is spread over each and every country in which it was accessed. Now the European Union, the Court of Justice for the European Union has come to a different conclusion here. They said that the tort of defamation is uh, committed at the place and only at a place of the establishment of the publisher. 
So the Court of Justice in a case called Shevel basically said that, which is normally, uh, not necessarily, but normally the domicile of the defendant because that's the publisher. So FIA, which is this case establishing tort jurisdiction under the European rules, basically has, as I said earlier, two grounds for jurisdiction. One is the ground that the tort was committed. The other one is where the direct damage occurred. Now, as I said, FIA is an environmental case, nothing to do really with defamation, but this is the basis for all tort cases. Now, the next case under the European system was a case called Shevel, which I mentioned already. So again, Shevel, case from 1995. This is really before social media, even before the internet, I guess, to some extent. So in Shevel, we have a English lady, Fiona Shevel, who works, I think it's a student, uh, or you know, it's a sort of first job kind of thing in Paris, uh, at a money exchange booth and she and her employer were basically defamed by a French publication uh, published by Press Alliance, I think it was Francois, and um, she was really domiciled and had a reputation in only in England, in Yorkshire, where she was from, and so the question was can she sue locally in England? Can she sue this French publication, it's a newspaper publication, in uh, before the English courts in, in the tort of defamation. So this went all the way up to the Court of Justice of the European Union on this question whether she can sue locally in her own jurisdiction. So here we have the claimant wanting to sue uh, at home, so to speak. And here the court, the Court of Justice of the European Union established the so-called mosaic rule. And basically this says, beer the beer case, which I mentioned earlier, applies to a defamation. And basically, she can sue where she has suffered harm. In fact, she can sue in each and every country where she has suffered damage to reputation. But if she sues in each and every jurisdiction, she can only recover damages for the loss suffered in that particular jurisdiction. So obviously, uh, Miss Shevel wasn't a famous uh, person, but assuming for a moment she, she had been a, a famous actress who had a reputation all over the European Union, so she could have then, if she could have then in theory sued in France for the damage to reputation there, then she could have sued in Belgium for the damage of reputation there, then she could have sued in the Netherlands for the damage to reputation there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the infamous uh, mosaic rule established by the Court of Justice in Shevel. Um, do you think the mosaic rule, let's uh, stop here for a second. Do you think this rule is fair? So think of a you know, defamation on social media um, and imagine the claimant within the European Union, so this rule obviously only applies in the Brussels regulation, it applies to the courts within the European Union. So we say we have a, a, a defendant in, I don't know, Greece, um, and someone who has been defamed on a social media site or blog or something in England, but they are fa a famous person, so it's a politician, someone we all know, and they then start suing in each and every jurisdiction across the EU. But of course, they can only recover a proportionate amount of damages in each jurisdiction. Is that a good rule, would you say? Yeah, I'll bet this. Oh, sorry, I have to allow you to talk. Here we go. Do you want to unmute yourself or shall okay. I unmute? Uh, Hello, hi. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, I can, yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, so <clears throat> I think the, the, this mosaic rule, it's not so fair because of at least two reasons. First is the risk of multiple damages, which uh, could be uh, 
much more than could be awarded at one state. And second is uh, that there could be some conflicting decisions uh, ma made because of uh, the multiple litigation in different states with different uh, a culture and tradition. I think that's actually one one issue is here, as you say, is this sort of the risk of irreconcilable um, judgments as well. And, you know, what does that mean for, you know, if the European Union is this internal market and the idea is have a, to, to align systems of jurisdiction, if you then have inconsistent rulings, I think that could be seen as, as, as a negative, as you rightly say. Another problem, I think, is that it's very difficult to actually, um, you know, how do you actually assess the damages? You know, how do you much, how much of, you know, what portion of the damages have actually happened in France? Or, you know, how do you actually, in terms of the evidence, how do you actually assess the damage to reputation in each country? I think that's, that's also one of them. And it would be hugely cumbersome and burdensome, wouldn't it, to go through a procedure like this? Um, this also applies, by the way, to IP disputes. Looking at uh, some of your questions, I'm, I'm just opening up the question and answer. And I think you are actually right. This video has been set up so that, I, that you can't switch on your, your videos. It's, it's actually been done by someone else. I didn't do it. Let me actually see whether, because normally you, you can switch on the video of people. But uh, let me see actually whether that. Um, video settings. No, that's only my own video settings. There was a button, but I can't see it. It might well have been set up in such a way that I can't. Okay. Oh, well, we have to do without uh, the videos then. Uh, question. Can Article 7.2 be employed when all the defendants are outside the EU? Well, if all the defendants are outside the EU, then that means basically that the Brussels regulation does not apply. And then you would have to uh, fall back on the national uh, court rules. So the Brussels regulation is not a complete harmonization of all the jurisdictional uh, rules. Um, and then we have uh, another comment. So the mosaic rule will require a lot of resources to sue in various jurisdictions. It is not practical and realistic. Exactly, that's, that's an, another objection made to the mosaic rule, particularly from a claimant's point of view, in the sense that, you know, is, is in practice, will, will anyone really want to sue in, in, you know, in all the different member states? Um, so yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. Um, okay. Yes, sorry, actually, I, I um, uh, this has also been set up so that, that the videos are off, which is, um, oh, wait a minute, ah, oh, this is, okay. Okay, so then let me continue, unless there are any more questions. Okay. Now the mosaic rule has been uh, criticized a lot and has been controversial within the EU. There are loads of scholars who actually say that it's not such a good, good rule. Um, in uh, in the next case in, in the European Union, uh, and this is e-date advertising versus X and Oliver Martinez versus MGN, which is the mirror group. Uh, in, um, th those two cases were joined together. And here the question was uh, exactly what Alberta actually has just mentioned, this problem that if you sue, if you want to sue not in the uh, defendant's jurisdiction, but you want to sue anywhere where you've suffered harm, you will have to bring a case in, in all the different states where you've suffered harm, which is not very practical. 
So here the Court of Justice asks itself, should there be another jurisdiction where you can sue for the whole loss? So basically, if, before I talk about this case, the, the position under European law and Article 7.2 at the moment is this. The claimant can either sue in the defendant's domicile, so the claimant can sue wherever the defendant is domiciled for defamation, and then they can sue for the whole loss, all the damage. Or they can sue in each and every member state where they suffer damage, but they only get partial damages in that case. Now, eBay and advertising is a slightly curious case. Um, it was basically arose in the German courts and concerned two murderers, X and Y, obviously not named in the judgment, um, who basically, this, this was a case which had been hugely uh, publicized in Germany. So we had these two guys, X and Y, who killed or murdered a very famous German actor. Actually, I remember this case from the 1990s. He was this sort of very outwardly played these roles where he was this really conservative Bavarian um, sort of, you know, played a particular character, I guess, in his, in his roles. But I guess in his private life, he was a, he was a very different person in a way. And he um, had loads of, um, how would you say that? He, he just had a very active sex life, let's put it that way, <laughs> involving gay sex. And often people, obviously, he didn't know. And he was then murdered by two young men in, a, in an absolutely horrific murder involving stabbing. And um, it was gruesome. And of course, as you can imagine, the press, for the press, this was a, a feast in the sense that, you know, A, they could then reveal, you know, all the details of his intimate private life, which obviously was very different from what the, what the public had expected. But also it was a very gruesome and horrific murder. So there was a lot of press interest and the story was, was reported all over Germany. This, I think, was in 1990. Then these guys, finally, they found the murderers. These guys were convicted and sentenced, I can't remember, to 15 or 20 years in prison. They served a prison sentence and then eventually were released from prison. And then after their release, they sued um, the older newspapers and even Wikipedia and all online media who tried to then in a way report, continuously report obviously on this old story. And there's a law in Germany as there is I think in many country which concerns the rehabilitation of offenders. So the idea is basically that once a person has been convicted, uh, they serve their sentence and they go back into society, then the press shouldn't always kind of keep repeating this old story so that these people have a chance to reintegrate in society. That's obviously a very difficult balance, again, I guess, between freedom of expression and um, rehabilitation of offenders. Ultimately, in this particular case, the, the German courts have found that these two murderers don't, their right to privacy doesn't outweigh the right of freedom of expression. So ultimately these uh, reports could be published, but this is not really what we're looking here. In this particular case, those two guys tried to suppress a publication, I think on an Austrian website. Um, and the question was, where's jurisdiction? Can they sue in Germany or do they have to sue in Austria? Um, in this particular case, the European Court of Justice developed yet a third place of jurisdiction where the claimant can sue for the whole loss. Because the, the Court of Justice basically said the place where the uh, victim of a defamation, in other words, the claimant, has the center of their life, you know, that this is where their domicile or where their main business interest is, but this particular country should have jurisdiction where the claimant can sue for the whole loss. So applying this to this particular German case, I guess the argument would have been that because this Austrian online website would have known that these two murderers had obviously their domicile in Germany, therefore they shouldn't be the Austrian publication shouldn't be surprised that they are actually suing them for the whole loss in Germany. Um, so basically, this is sometimes called the center of interest or the center of gravity test. 
and allows the uh, claimant to sue at their habitual residence or place of work and they can sue for the whole loss, not just a fraction of the loss. The argument is that this is a reasonably foreseeable place because normally the defendant in a defamation case will know where the claimant is domiciled and where they have the center of interest. It's a kind of, if you want, a targeting test. In other words, the definition has been targeted at this particular place. This center of interest test under European law applies both to individuals and business. Um, so in a Swedish case, which was then referred to again to the European Court of Justice. So in this, I can't, uh, I don't know, actually, I don't speak Swedish. I think it's called Bolag Subleisningen, but uh, I might pronounce this completely wrongly. But anyway, here we have an Estonian business. I can't remember what the business was, but anyway, they this Estonian-based business targeted their activities to Sweden, exclusively to Sweden. So their website was in Swedish, all their customers were Swedish, but the business itself was based in Estonia. Um, so obviously on the internet, it's very easy, isn't it, to target another jurisdiction with a you know, service business. And uh, consumers in Sweden complained about this particular business on a website, I think, or on some sort of, you know, I, I think it was some sort of customer feedback in Sweden. And the Estonian company then wanted to sue these uh, Swedish customers in Estonia on, and basically arguing, well, we're an Estonian business. This is where our center of our interests is. This is where we establish. This is basically where we are. So the question in this particular case was, does this center of gravity uh, test apply to business? And here the Court of Justice of the European Union said yes. So in other words, if a business sues for defamation, so unjustified and false statements in relation to their business, they can sue in the place where they have the center of their interests. But here for businesses, it's not the domicile of the business, it's actually where the business's goodwill is located or the place to which its products are targeted to. So here the European Court of Justice basically says, well, it doesn't matter that you're in Estonia. If you look at your website and your goodwill and where your customers are, all these factors are actually based in Sweden. So therefore the Swedish courts have jurisdiction, but not the Estonian courts. Um, so the Mosaic law, as I say, has been criticized uh, because often damage is widespread, it allows the claimant, especially if the claimant is a famous person which has a reputation in several EU member states, well, it's really difficult to quantify the damaged reputation, but also they could sue in, mul uh, in, in multiple jurisdictions, which of course is then very unfair to the defendant. So the mosaic rule could be used as a tool to suppress freedom of expression by simply harassing, uh, the, harassing the defendant by suing in many different jurisdictions. Because obviously it's a huge burden to uh, defend yourself in various jurisdictions. And if the claimant is a, a rich, very rich person, then they can easily do that. So it's been criticized by the Attorney General Bobek in this Bullock Supply Sling in case which I've uh, just mentioned. Okay, so European Court of Justice um, is basically the cases of Beer and Shevel, and we basically have, the claimant has a choice. We have two rules initially. They can either sue in the place where they have suffered damage, but only for the amount of damage suffered to the reputation in that particular country. They can sue the uh, defendant in the defendant's domicile, um, based, also based on the idea uh, that the publication occurs where the defendant is established. And then in e-date advertising, this is this case about the murder of the German actor, where the court basically said, we can also identify a third place of jurisdiction 
And this is where the claimant, you know, the victim of the defamation had their center of their life, the center of their interests. So in other words, for an individual claimant, that is where they are domiciled. And for a business is where they have their goodwill and their reputation. So those are the rules under the uh, European Brussels regulation, which applies when all the defendants are based in the European Union. So we have partial harmonization in the European Union. But of course, um, we also still have the English common law, which applies where the defendant is outside the European Union. So imagine um, a person has been defamed, say, in the US. Obviously, the US traditionally has had a very a uh, wide notion of freedom of expression, free, uh, freedom of speech, and therefore limits defamation claims under its constitutional law. And for this reason, it's very attractive for US claimants to sue under the English common law. So the English common law is still relevant here because it applies where the defendant is outside the European Union, such as a US magazine or US publication and US um, author. Um, so basically, under the English common law, you can always sue at the place where the defendant is present. So it's actually sufficient for the defendant to be present in England, or obviously being domiciled in England, where they voluntarily submit to jurisdiction. But if the defendant is not in, in England, then basically the English courts will ask for permission from the court to service proceedings outside the jurisdiction. So the way jurisdictional rules present themselves under English law is that you basically need to initially decide the jurisdiction of the English courts first. And the rules are contained in paragraph 3.1 of practice direction 6b, which is sort of the English civil procedure rules. I'll go over that. So, but before I look at the civil procedure rules, there is this instrument in the common law, and we'll find that in many common law jurisdictions, called forum non convenience. So, a horrible Latin expression. Basically, this gives the court a power, a discretionary power, to decline jurisdiction. So therefore, in a way, if you want, the jurisdiction of the English courts is, uh, has two elements to it. First of all, you have to check under the jurisdiction rules, is there jurisdiction? But even if there is jurisdiction, the court still has a discretionary power to decline jurisdiction on the basis that the English courts are not the convenient forum to hear a dispute. So this goes back really to a, a case, a commercial case from 1987, Spilly, Ada Maritime Corporation and Cancer Legs. And basically how is this decided? Well, this is basically both legal and practical considerations. So the court will look at where's the evidence, where are the witnesses, where is the main gist of the case, is it in the interests of justice to hear this case before the English courts? Or would a claimant have an alternative court who is in a better position to actually hear the dispute? So you could say, oh, that's interesting. Has this been used in defamation cases? And the answer is this has been very rarely used. So even though the English courts have this power in defamation cases, this power has been rarely used. And I will come back to that uh, in, in a little bit later. So what are the rules, however? So what are the jurisdictional rules of the English court? So assuming at the moment we have a US author on Facebook who defamed, um, I don't know, say a Polish person uh, claiming that they have connections to the mafia and that they are a disreputable business person. Now, assuming that this Polish person has actually substantial connections and a substantial reputation in England, the question arises, can they sue in England? Well, if you purely look at the jurisdictional rules, the answer might, might well be yes, because just it's actually exactly the same as the Brussels regulation. So, a claimant can sue in England 
if the damage to reputation was sustained in England or if the act, in other words, the defamation, was committed in England. So it's exactly the same as the Brussels regulation. But what is different in terms of the place where the defamation has been committed, the common law focuses on the place of access or downloading. So we've seen under the European rule that the place of committing a defamation was the establishment of the publisher, not so under the common law. So the common law basically says a defamation is committed at the place of publication and on the internet and all online communications, that's the place of access or the place of downloading uh, the communication. So this was first held in the Goodnick case, which I mentioned earlier. So in order to find jurisdiction by the English court, the claimant has to show that the publication has been downloaded in England and that there was damage to reputation here. Now, this has been uh, actually quite relevant. There have been a number of cases in the early 2000s where the court, the English courts, have found jurisdiction even though neither party was based or domiciled or resident in England. Um, so basically all the claimant had to show is that they had some damage to reputation, uh, either with some sort of business or family links within England. Um, and that was sufficient to bring a, a libel case in England. So in order to illustrate this, um, I'll focus on two cases. Uh, one is Harrods and uh, Dow Jones. So this was obviously Dow Jones is a, is a large publisher in one of their business magazines, I can't remember which one, there was a false statement concerning Harrods and the owner of Harrods. Um, I can't remember exactly what the statement was. I think it was meant as a joke, but obviously if it was read literally, then it would have been defamatory. Um, so Harrods sued Dow Jones in respect of his publication, arguing that it was accessible from England and therefore that would be sufficient for jurisdiction. And the court basically said found jurisdiction in this case. In Lewis and King, we have basically um, a boxing champion suing uh, the promoter in respect of a defamatory allegation I think saying that this person is, is racist. Again, it was an online publication. Both parties are obviously based in the US, but obviously Lewis has a substantial reputation um, in this country and all over the world. And again, the court found jurisdiction on the basis that there was damage to reputation and that was sufficient, even though both parties were not in the UK. Um, so what's, what's your opinion on this idea that a um, US person who's domiciled in the US can be sued in respect of a statement which has been made in the US but is obviously available online on some sort of social media, can be sued in England on the basis that they that the claimant has a reputation in England. And of course the language is the same. So people will have access to that online statement um, in England, just as they would have accessed it in, um, in the US. What's your view? Is that? Well, uh, if, if I may say, so I, I think there's a, an issue of public policy. And if we uh, regard the the person as a weak, uh, as a as a party which which uh, which has its own legitimate interest and sometimes is more more weak than uh, than a publisher, for instance, we could to some extent apply principles that are applicable in consumer law, uh, saying that uh, that. Uh, if any defamatory statements uh, have been made, uh, 
uh, the, the 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 claimant can choose the the forum which is more con the, the most convenient for him, and, and usually it is the place where he or she is domiciled. The most convenient, I agree with you. The most convenient forum often is where, where you're domiciled. But I guess in in relation to defamation, for example, in the U.S that you cannot sue for defamation if you are um, a public figure. So if you're a politician or an actor or you're in the public limelight, that might actually defeat your claim for defamation. Again, based on this notion that in the US of uh, the importance of freedom of speech. And it's for that reason that in many of these cases, the claimant wouldn't have a case in the US. So they sue in England thinking, oh, well, you know, there's less protection in terms of freedom of, of expression. They're not the same kind of defenses. And that essentially means that the uh, uh, libel action is, is more successful in, in the UK or in England than it would be in the US. And I think that has been largely been the, the driver of that conflict. And this has actually led in the US to specific legislation basically saying um, that the US will then not enforce any of these defamation claims which, which are handed down or, you know, judgments which are handed down by an English court. So it's kind of led to almost like a diplomatic type of conflict between England uh, and the US. I think I've managed, I had to actually for each of you to press a button, say, allow to talk, which hopefully now means that you can unmute yourself and actually join in the discussion. Sorry, I wasn't aware I had to do this. So you're very welcome uh, to unmute yourself if you want and and join the discussion. I'm really sorry, I didn't know I had to um, allow you to talk but, uh, be before you can take part. So if you know, if you have any comments or statements or something, you know, just unmute and, and come in. I really don't mind. I'm, I'm very ha happy to be interrupted as well. Um, are you with me so far or are there any questions? So, so this idea again of, you know, uh, libel tourism allowing in particular US claimants uh, to sue in respect of online defamations in England based on the idea that they have a reputation in England. Obviously not every person in the US has a reputation in, in the UK, but if you think of, you know, you know famous politicians actors, etc., who have a reputation uh, all over the world, in particular in England, could in theory then simply come here and sue here. Okay, I'll, I'll continue, but as I say, please do feel free to, to, to butt in if, if you like. Um, so because of this conflict, uh, in a way between US freedom of expression, freedom of speech and English defamation law, which allows for libel tourism because basically the jurisdictional saying someone can sue in England if they have a reputation in England and their reputation has been damaged. Since that is the jurisdictional gateway, um, the, there's been a long discussion to reform defamation law uh, in England. And this has finally been done by the Defamation Act of 2013. And this has basically made two changes. The first one is there is no presumption that a defamation leads to damage to reputation. So in other words, a claimant has to prove that they have suffered damage to their reputation before they can bring an action. So that is one hurdle in terms of bringing an action before the English courts. The second hurdle is section 9.2 and this is quite significant. Basically for um, non, if the European rules don't apply and as I say they don't apply if the defendant is based outside the EU, so for example in relation to a US defendant, then if the claimant wants to bring an action, they have to show that England must be the most appropriate place to sue. Not just an appropriate place, which is forum non-convenience, 
but it must be the most appropriate place to sue. So this, I think, might be illustrated with, with a couple of, of, of cases. Um, first of all, actually, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. So right in the rear, I'll, I'll explain the case, and then I'll ask you what you think. So in right in the rear, we basically have um, a, now I think the claim, uh, the defendant was domiciled in Japan, I think originally a US national who's moved to Japan, but they had the citizenship of Kits and St. Nevis, I think. And this individual had claimed that, uh, were, I think, is the founder of or inventor of um, blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin. And or that they're not the inventor of Bitcoin, I can't remember. So it's something to do with Bitcoin. So basically, the defendant was alleging that the claimant, I think, was not the inventor of Bitcoin when he was himself saying, I am the inventor of Bitcoin. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what the dispute is. But the, it was a, a dispute relating to the identity of the person who invented Bitcoin. And uh, the claimant was or is a Australian national, but with substantial links, well, all over the world, but also in, in, in England. And so the question was whether the claimant could sue in England based on their substantial connections to England. Now, the allegation was made in a social media post. So in your opinion, should Mr. Wright be able to sue in England? So again, this is a dispute about who is the inventor of Bitcoin, we have a national of uh, St. Nevis and Kids who is now based in Japan, domiciled in Japan, who claims on a social media site that Mr. Wright is or is not, I can't remember now, the inventor of Bitcoin. And Mr. Wright is basically domiciled in Australia, um, but has substantial connections to England. Should he be able to sue before the English courts, considering you know that he has substantial connections in England and that these business connections could be potentially damaged, so he suffers damage to reputation, and of course all of this was in English, and of course there would have been people who accessed this in in, in the UK and in England in particular. Should he be able to sue? What do you think? Um. Well, Alberta is speaking. Well, I actually I have uh, sympathy to to allow claimants uh, suing at their domicile, uh, but as far as I recall, the 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 default rule of jurisdiction is that uh, the court where the the most uh, relevant evidence or uh, are located should be uh, should be the should be the court that. That has jurisdiction. So, in in that case, if the England court uh, uh, can have access to, to the, the most uh, relevant evidence that are also located in in the UK, I think it should have uh, jurisdiction over the dispute. Yeah, it's actually your answer is is is, is very. Good. Um, thank you very much. Actually, this this raises. I think you you hit the core of it, and uh, I explain actually why. And this is, in a way, what gives confusion, or what is very confusion. So, as I said earlier, um, there is this instrument, form non convenience under English law, which basically says gives the court the discretion whether to accept jurisdiction or not based on practical considerations. So where are the witnesses, where is the evidence? Is it possible to have a fair trial in England on a particular subject matter? Can the claimant sue somewhere else where perhaps the, the, the judgment will be better because of these practical and legal considerations? So it's a kind of interest of justice test. So this form and convenience test has been around since the 80s, is obviously very well established and, and has been used in, in various commercial cases. It's been considered in relation to defamation as well. 
But it now comes in the Defamation Act specifically with the aim of defeating libel tourism. In other words, not allowing non-English claimants to sue in England unless England is in fact the most appropriate place to sue for defamation. So the first question we have, is this like forum non-convenience, but just a little bit more strict? And the court basically said no. So the most appropriate place to sue is much, a much stricter test. So what the courts in Wright and Ruhr and in Ahusha versus Politici Novine have, argued, have said basically is that you look at the download numbers. So you look, you have to basically take a global view on the number of publications. And then you have to figure out how many of these publications have in fact happened in England. And it's almost a, a really silly test if most of the publication has actually happened in England, you know, for example, download figures, then the English courts have jurisdiction. So the preponderance of publication in England seems to be the most important part of the analysis. But that to me seems to be really unfair, right? Because even one single publication, if it's read by the right person, could be very injurious and damaging to a person's reputation, right? It's not just the amount of publication, it's actually, you know, who reads this and who, the impact is actually more important. But it seems that the court have taken a very uh, a strong view that you look purely at the number of publications and the number of downloads, say, in, in online context, in order to decide whether England is the most appropriate place to sue. So you could say, in a way, there are two considerations. If you know, if you if you approach this test uh, afresh and you ask yourself, is England the most appropriate place to sue? Clearly, you can look in, on the download and publication figures, but you could also look at to what extent has this particular publication impacted the, the, the claimant in England, specifically in England? Has it been targeted to England? And I think this is, um, in a way, illustrated by the second case, Ahucha and Politica Novinia. Sorry, I don't speak, I think it's Serbian, it's probably, I'm pronouncing it probably completely wrongly. But here we have basically a, um, Serbian businessman who is defamed allegedly in a Serbian publication. Again, I think it's, it's uh, allegations to do with fraud and money laundering or something. But this is a Serbian publication in the Serbian language, which I think is published as a newspaper or magazine or something in Serbia. But of, of course, the allegations are also contained in the online version of this particular uh, newspaper. And so, uh, but it is in the Serbian language, but of course there'll be many people in England who, who are from Serbia or also speak the language. So, so that in itself doesn't defeat the claim. And here the courts say, well, if you look at the overall picture, it's very clear that this publication really is targeted at the Serbian market. Okay, there might be a few people in England and Wales who can read it, but the, it's, it's just, it's focus of publication really is Serbia. And so again, the court said England is probably not the most appropriate place to sue. The claimant hasn't made out uh, this burden that they must show that the, uh, England is the most appropriate place and therefore again, jurisdiction was denied. Do you think this is correct? Do you think this test makes sense to say that you, you have to decide whether before the English courts can assume jurisdiction, um, the, the claimant has to show that England is the most appropriate place, or is that too strict? What about those people? Right, so if you go back to the good old Shevel case, well, in Shevel, you know, the, the victim of the defamation, the claimant had only one reputation. She was domiciled in, 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 in Yorkshire, she was local. So in a way it made sense for her to sue uh, in England. In Wright and Ruhr, this last case I mentioned concerning the Bitcoin inventor or non-inventor, um, this particular case, we have someone with a global reputation. The medium is global because it was a social media post the sort of community is global because it's kind of the tech Bitcoin community, which I'm sure is not um, 
just from one particular country. So in those sort of cases where someone has a truly global re reputation, it might be really difficult to identify which place, which country, you know, looked at all over the world is the most appropriate place to sue. Because if someone has a global reputation, they communicate via a social media uh, platform, which is also global, and the community listening or, or engaging with this, this social media website is also global because it's all about tech. It's not necessarily focused on one particular jurisdiction. Then actually it's really difficult, isn't it, to identify the, the, the proper court. Do you have any questions, comments? Um, <clears throat> well, well but I think that, uh, well, this uh, test, uh, for instance, look on the number of publications, downloads, or to uh, look whether the UK is the most appropriate place, it could be to some extent too technical. Because, for instance, let's say if we have a very similar amount of downloads in the uh, UK and, uh, let's say, France, or, or uh, there is an equal uh, uh, portion of interest in, in, the, in the UK and France, so we could have the same issues we had in Mosaic uh, rule, when it is uh, really difficult to the court then to decide where, which place is the most appropriate? Mm. I think the, so this, in a way, the, the Defamation Act, I think was introduced to deal with the specific issue of US claimants who come to the UK or come to England to sue in a way to, to circumvent, if you want, the, the more restrictive rules on defamation in the US. But in a way, it has not, I think, solved the problem, as you rightly pointed out, because if we're talking here about publications on social media, which obviously are very uh, spread across the globe, the damage might also be spread across the globe. It's, very, it's even more difficult to, to, to justify or, or to, sorry, to identify which is actually the country which is the most appropriate place to sue, unless we, we invent some sort of internet uh, court which has jurisdiction for internet cases. So I think in some ways a more straightforward test perhaps would be some sort of targeting test, which is more what the Court of Justice of the European Union has done, I guess, in the e-data advertising case where they focus on the center of interest of the claimant. So you focus on a claimant, you look at where do they have their center of interest, you know, where are they domiciled, where have they got um, their focus in their life. And if this is foreseeable for the defendant, then perhaps that is the most appropriate court. Whereas at the moment, the English court seems to largely just focus on, you know, download numbers uh, and less so on a, on a targeting test. Um, I mean, you know, the, the case law might develop in this direction. But at the moment, the courts have been very keen to, uh, the English courts have been very keen to decline jurisdiction. I guess to deal with this specific allegation of libel tourism. Let me know if there are any more comments, questions. Um, okay. Um, uh, I, mm -hmm. if, if, if I may, uh, actually, in if I'm not mistaken, in Ovusu case, or Ovusu, I don't know how to spell it correctly, ECJ said that the uh, forum non-convenient uh, rule is not, or forum shopping rule is not applicable within the EU because there are very clear jurisdictional rules and, and court uh, actually do, do not have uh, discretion. That's that's correct. So yeah, so it, I guess in all European member states we have this strange division now between two sets of jurisdictional rules. So we have the EU jurisdictional rules, which have been partly harmonized if one of defendants is based in the EU. Oh. And then we have the national rules. If none of the defendants are based in the EU, then you know French civil procedure rules, English civil procedure rules, German civil procedure rules, Polish civil procedure rules. So all the national rules will apply. Now, the foreign and convenience is a common law concept, so it will apply in, in the English courts, I don't know, presumably also in the Irish courts, but it doesn't apply to the EU set of jurisdictional rules. In the Oversu case, which is a, a rather 
terrible, tragic case where a uh, English domiciled person went to Jamaica and dived into a into the water stair and broke his neck. So a very serious injury. This was a personal injury claim. And he sued, assuming he sued a tour operator, which was, he was based, I think, in, in England. So the European rules applied. And the court wanted to come to the conclusion that actually this case should really be heard in Jamaica, because that's where the accident occurred, that's where all the health and safety issues arose. And then the Court of Justice of the European Union said, no, you know, if when the European Brussels regulation applies, the court, even the English courts, don't have the discretion of form non convenience. Um, so, yeah, form non convenience only applies in the context of the common law. The US courts also apply form non convenience, um, the Australian courts do. So, it's very much a common law instrument. Um, okay, I will just briefly sum up because I think we're also running out of time. Um, so, to sum up, um, Two sets of, of jurisdictional rules in the area of defamation um, in, from, a, from an English point of view. Obviously, the first point to remember is that when you have a defamation case, someone being defamed, say, on a social media uh, platform, the decision where to sue, say, the claimant, the person who's been defamed, wants to sue, will be in many ways a strategical one. So you will look at, you know, where can I get the most damages, which courts are the cheapest to sue in, which courts are the most accessible one. This can be the local court, or it can be a court such as the English courts where you're more likely to get substantial damages. You then, once you have an idea of where you want to sue, you check the rules of jurisdiction. And the rules of jurisdiction within the European Union have a sort of two-way uh, pathway if you want because we have a partially harmonized EU jurisdiction regime but if none of the defendants are within the EU then the national rules apply. Now within the EU rules if they apply so if the defendant is actually in the EU then we can either sue a defendant's domicile but if that's not what you want then you check Article 7.2, which creates a special rule of jurisdiction at the place where the tort was committed or at the place where any of the harm to reputation has occurred. So in terms of the places where the harm to reputation has occurred, if a person has a reputation in several EU member states, they can choose. They can sue in each and every jurisdiction, but only to the extent they have suffered damage in that jurisdiction. So that's the famous mosaic rule. But I can sue for the whole loss at the defendant's domicile. So if our, defend, if our defamer has been in France, they can sue for the whole loss in France. Um, so that's basically the European rules. Then in terms of the national rules in, in, in England, obviously we have the common law applying and it's kind of uh, different from the EU because under the common law, the tort of defamation is committed at a place of uh, downloading. So in a funny sort of way, the place of the harm, the place of the damage, and the place of where the tort is committed fall together at the place of downloading. And so this means obviously that there is a lot of forum shopping. And this has been rectified to some extent by the Defamation Act 2013, which now limits jurisdiction of the English courts. Basically, it says you can only sue in England. So for example, a US defendant can only sue in England if England is the most appropriate place. And for that, it seems that the court in Wright and Ruhr and in um, Ahusha seem to focus very much on the number of downloads. So they look at the global publication figures and they look at is the majority of downloads in England. So that's in a way a very, very narrow interpretation. Okay, so that was um, a run through the rather complicated but very important rules on defamation jurisdiction, focusing mainly obviously on um, the EU and England. Obviously there's a whole um, you know, section on, on US as well. So 
Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope I haven't confused you too much. Um, I, as I say, I've, uh, the, my book on jurisdiction rules will be published in the autumn. In terms of modules on the LLM, there's a specific module where we look at jurisdiction, not just obviously for defamation and tort, but we look at various aspects of jurisdiction online and the internet as a cross-border medium. Um, and one of the sessions is, is on, on defamation jurisdiction. Um, I hope you find this interesting as a sort of, uh, you know, some of you will, will are actually taking at the moment that the distance learning course on uh, jurisdiction. And obviously some of you would have sort of come in to see this as a taster lecture. Um, I hope some of you, some of you will join me um, this autumn and this next academic year. Well, we also have a blended form of learning where, you know, you will have some online lectures, you have some online tutorials, you have some online quizzes and other activities online. We'll make the courses as interactive and as fun as possible. For those of you who come to London, and obviously I hope that uh, many of you will obviously have, hopefully will have, if we're allowed by the government and the regulations, etc. but we hopefully can have some workshops and uh, other uh, presence um, teaching activities on campus as, as normally. So that's what I mean with blended learning. We probably have a mixture of online and face-to-face uh, -face, um, interactions. Um, do let me know if you have any further questions. I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes. Um, yeah, I, I agree. So, someone has said, it comes up as an anonymous uh, attendee, so I don't know who, who it was, it doesn't matter either, but you say, and I agree with you, the, the, the internet is accessible anywhere, so it's problematic that I, I defend, identify the most appropriate jurisdiction, which obviously is now to test under the UK Defamation Act. And in some ways, the e-data e test, which focuses on the centre of interest, is, is a more appropriate and more workable approach. Um, that's definitely, that's something I, I, I agree as well. Uh, great, so um, we'll have another taster lecture. I think it's in next week, is that right? Um, and I hope to see some of you in, in that. It's a lecture on artificial intelligence and online profiling and advertising, which is another area which I think is, is really interesting. Um, I hope I can see many of you there. Um, if not, I hope you have a, a, a good summer and uh, yeah, all the best. Thank you very much for attending today. It was really good to uh, see you all here.